Welcome everyone to this evening, taking it to the next level, decolonizing climate action. So glad to have you all here. And I would like to invite you to join me in uh, first a land acknowledgement. You may notice that people are already beginning to put their own introductions and land acknowledgements into the chat, you could just say hi, your name and where you're where you're coming from. And uh, we also invite you to take a moment to pause and really think about where we are and, and what has come before us. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and beyond. We recognize their presence on and relationship with the land for time immemorial. I acknowledge the original caretakers of this land where I am, the Huron-Wendat, the Toon, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous peoples. And across this land, I acknowledge the Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto, and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Innu, and so many more, all the nations that came before us and those yet to become. Honoring strength and struggle, wisdom and grief, we acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. And I would invite you to join me in a moment's pause again with prayer. And I want to share with you a blessing for presence that is attributed to John O'Donohue. May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. May you receive great encouragement when front, new frontiers beckon. May you respond to the call of your gift and find the courage to follow its path. May the flame of anger free you from falsity. May warmth of heart keep your presence aflame and anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror an inner dignity of soul. May you take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you be consoled in the secret symmetry of your soul. May you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. So we thank John O'Donohue for those thoughts that bring us in to the presence of this moment. We ask the spirit, the creator, to bless our time together and to open our hearts and minds, our will to action, to the words we will hear tonight. Amen. And with that, I would like to turn this evening over to our host and moderator, Randy Haluza DeLay, who is the Ecological Justice Coordinator at Kairos. Randy. Greetings, everybody. I'm very excited that you're here to wrap up Climate Action Month. Uh, our theme has been decolonizing climate action, and you heard that in the title. How do we take it to the next step? How do we go beyond just thinking about it or reading words about it and trying to do something? to make it practical, to implement some sort of new movement in climate action. Um, I'm very excited for 
the people that we have here, we have four, I'll call them panelists, who will be participating. And we're gonna do it in an interview sort of format, a question and response. Um, I'll give each of them a moment to introduce themselves and uh, respond quickly to the theme. And then I'll, I'll ask questions of them for each of them to respond and, and we'll see how that goes. Um, it will be full, um, but like I said, I'm very excited because each of them come from very different perspectives with an amazing amount of experience and an amazing amount of different things that they're doing that all very much relate to, to this theme of how we can be more effective in terms of creating a more just and sustainable word, world um, especially around climate action. So um, our, th our three panelists and one post panelist, I'll say, <laughs> um, our three panelists are uh, Gitsa uh, Tanamuk, um, Amara Olson, uh, and Anapama Ranawana Kali. And then our post panelist is one of Kairos and uh, For the Love of Creations, uh, delegates to COP27, and that's Yusra Shafi. And she's going to be kind of responding at the very end, given what she's heard, how will she be moving forward to, you know, think about this while she's at COP27 and then in communication afterwards or during. Um, so Kitsitanamuk is well known to people at Kairos uh, because he's been part of the Indigenous Rights Circle for a very long time. Amara Rolson is in Toronto where he runs the Community Climate Resilience Center as a research project on racial reconciliation and justice and climate change. And uh, Anu is a post-colonial feminist theologian who has worked in Canada, but who has roots in Sri Lanka and is currently located in the UK where it's doggone awfully late in the evening. So, um, I'm just going to turn it over to each of you. And, and the first question I wanted to ask is if in one sentence you could say your response to the theme when you heard about it, decolonizing climate action, what do you think about that theme, that phrase? Probably should unmute each of you. So Gitsitanamak, do you want to go first? And then Amara and then Annie. Sure. sure. Uh, I'm not accustomed to uh, using one sentence, so I'm <laughs> going to do my really best. Uh, my first impression is that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> good idea. Um, I, I would you know, probably qualify that by saying that um, uh, decolonization in, in my lens is about reconciling our presence in the earth. And uh, decolonization is a very good step in the right direction. Yeah, I guess I'm cool. Thank you. Um, thank you, Randy. I think, um, my response to that is decolonization um, is deep waters that draws us into conversations about profoundly transformative change. Um, and that decolonization is absolutely necessary because the climate crisis that is upon us now and that will worsen over time started the colonization. So we must return to the beginning um, to move towards a different future. Um, thanks, Randy. Thanks, everyone. Good to be here. Um, uh, well, difficult to do in one sentence, but I think um, is it exactly that's it. It's difficult to talk about this in one sentence because it in it asks us to do something complex, something heavy, and to engage in um, very deep discussions. So that's that's my thinking on that. Well, thank you. Now we've got the pithy things that we can all be tweeting out. So that's great. <laughs> um, so I'd like to do another round and, and have you each introduce yourself a little bit and then 
talk a little bit more about um, what does decolonization mean? So you can explain a little bit from your work or how you've tried to operationalize that in your work, but do go ahead and ex uh, introduce yourself a little bit more in the very short introduction that I gave you. So we can go in the same order, how about? So it gets a okay. You... Okay. Yeah, I, I sort of unmuted myself. So I couldn't get back in. So thank you for the heads up, Randy. Um, could you just remind? <laughs> could you just remind me that because I was busy doing something else. Go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more than the very short introduction that I gave. And then uh, explain a little bit more about decolonization and what you mean by it and what it, you, how you understand it and maybe how you've tried to operationalize that in the things that you've, you've been doing. Okay. <laughs> Now, in uh, my name is Kisita I uh, come from the Wampanoag community, Mashpee, which is now located on a, traditionally how we understood was Nutsit. Uh, but uh, Samuel Champlain decided to call it Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, one of my uh, main focuses is how do we bring people back together in the sense of, of what relations mean with to uh, indigenous peoples here in the Americas. Um, and uh, when I think about decolonization, I'm coming from a particular lens uh, because in Indian country, we're still kind of work through, through we're working through these uh, relationships with both United States and Canada, which haven't quite decolonized their policies and their mindsets. You know? um, when I think about decolonization, um, I think we're all have suffered from a colonial mindset about our presence on the earth and our presence with each other. Um, uh, and you know, there's, there's many reasons for it. A lot of it's historic, uh, but we managed to maintain a historic presence in our minds, the way that we live in society, our economy, our political, social um, no, normal, normalness, if I can put it like that. Uh, and each of those kind of society, societal values really inhibit um, the kind of relationship that we're really seeking with each other. Uh, so I, I believe that um, we, we can all do ourselves a great favor uh, by revisiting those social norms and those uh, social, political, economic values that uh, we carry, uh, because I believe that those are uh, very much linked to how the how Earth and how the climate is responding um, to our uh, oblivious uh, lifestyles and our in, in the neglect that that we are sharing and showing in our human footprints. Um, with that said, I'm a great admirer for um, that divine love that, uh, that reeks in the hope, in the very presence of the earth and creation. And, uh, and I'm really glad to be here and sharing this time with, with my new friends and colleagues. And uh, I really believe we'll get there. I don't think it's as com complicated, but you know, our, our, our human qualities seem to complicate the simplicity. Uh, so uh, that's my opening salvo, <laughs> put it that way. Thank you, um, Amara. 
Int yeah. Feel free to introduce yourself and then uh, explain a little bit more in depth what decolonization means and how you have operationalized it or made it into practice. Yeah, happy to do that. So um, my name is Amara Ajani uh, Rolston, um, born and raised um, here, um, but my family's originally from um, Barbados, a uh, small country in the Caribbean. Um, some folks engage in climate um, might be familiar with the Prime Minister, Mia Motley, who's been speaking quite strongly. And decolonization and climate change are very personal to me, partly because I come from a line of people whose bodies were used to establish the foundation for the Industrial Revolution. And if you go to um, my island, my country, you'll see huge parts of agricultural lands that were once um, rainforest and forest, um, protected, stewarded, and cared for by air rocks and caribs that were cleared for monocropping and for sugarcane. And so sort of in my blood, body, and bone, I carry this historical reality of the bonding of enslavement, the bonding of colonial violence, and the bonding with, with extractive industries and the plunder of the planet. And so it's a very personal thing for me and it's very personal also because I come from a community here and I come from a country that will be most affected and has contributed the least to the climate crises. Um, and so my work with the Community Climate Resilience Lab has been to advance a racial justice oriented approach to climate resilience. And resilience is a, is a dirty word for any folks who have had a long history of oppression and structural violence. Um, but we're very clear about the fact that we speak about resilience in terms of the weather, not in terms of the structures that put us in this position. And so when we speak of those structures, we speak of resistance. And the way we bring decolonization into our work is by looking at our work through three um, lenses. One, legacy. We need to have really difficult, as I know said, complicated conversations around the way legacies of racial injustice and colonialism have created a world that cannot sustain itself and it will continue to harm itself. The other is that we need to think about um, this work through emergence, which is not about top-down colonial approaches to system change. It's not about sort of patriarchal, big systems, mechanistic, let's build a, a machine and change the world. It's about relation-based small changes that can sort of unsettle the foundations that have been built in the most problematic ways. And then finally, um, the work of the lab is to imagine um, responses, resistance, and solutions that are framed through liberation. And we take nothing less than that. And so our idea is to imagine through a Black futurist and Afrofuturist standpoint, what liberation could look like um, in a climate just world, what liberation could look like in a decolonized world, and then create practical steps towards that with people, beside people, behind people when necessary. Um, and decolonization from our standpoint, so the last thing I'll say is sort of the sort of the, the deep underbed for racial justice. Um, racial justice from our standpoint is systemic change, um, it's transforming policy and institutions, but that as that doesn't, um, like our friend just said, radically transform the values upon which our society is built. And that's where we need to get to. Um, so yeah, that's me and that's the, the work that I do. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I, I feel intimidated to follow both those brilliant opening salvos. Um, my position, um, so uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm primarily, uh, I, I try to think of myself as a teacher, a pedagogue. Um, a lot of the work that I did when I was um, in Canada was as a public pedagogue um, for um, Caritas Canada, or Development and Peace is what you might know them as. Um, and um, I think from the perspective of, of teaching, of engaging, um, and also of international development, which is a field that I'm very, <laughs> very involved in. Um, decolonization is about the transformation of power 
and power relationships. Mm -hmm. It's very much about um, not just redistributing power um, in that sense, but I think about completely changing the way in which power is structured. And one of the things that a lot of people find hard um, is that it's hard to get your head around it, but I often tell people this is not easy. There's no toolkit. Um, I even actually have hesitancy when you use the word operationalize, Randy, because I think that suggests that there's going to be a way we can deploy this um, or there's a guideline or something like that. But decolonization is an invitation to an uncomfortable process. It's intended to, to discomfort. Um, and this is not a new conversation. Um, these conversations have been the not just conversation, sorry, the 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 demand for this has been around for a very, very long time. Um, and yet has not been listened to. Um, in fact, the voices that have asked for these for this transformation are continually silenced and marginalized. And now everyone's talking about decolonization and into the danger of becoming a buzzword which is why I bring this caution of saying it, it, it's not easy. It must be uncomfortable. Um, and it's not only about making room for the historically oppressed and excluded or the recognition of the violence that has been done. It's about radically altering the terms of the conversation um, in order to change the colonial mentality um, that as the previous two speakers have said, um, organize um, our moral codes. In fact, this is an ask for a spiritual and moral awakening, reawakening, um, if, if you will. Um, and, and I think it, it, it will be, the conversations will take different shapes in different spaces, um, uh, but that, that is, I think, necessary because justice will be different in different communities, in different spaces, especially I think when we kind of think outside of Western rationality, where history and present is all melded together, where knowledge is, um, is, is a pluriverse. And these are these things that need to come into the conversation. And we also need to be aware that this will take time. So those, that's, that's sort of off the top of my head with that. Thank you. I anyway, I want to follow up with you a little bit. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you are a theologian. So, I try. I try. So where, where is um, colonialism or decolonization in, in theology or in the religious life or in the churches or things like that? Um, again, um, this, this sort of depends on, on where, you, where you're looking at things from, right? Um, we have uh, some fascinating work from indigenous theology um, um, that I think is, is in a sense only now really being listened to, but has been um, vibrant and thriving, but simply not kind of entering into the canon or being seen as contextual theology. I hate that word contextual, um, but I think from indigenous theology, um, the Pacifica theologian, um, John Javier, he talks about how when um, the colonizers first came to the Pacific, um, the people could not understand the God they preached because this was a God who was not connected to land or ocean or air. So they, they said, this is not a God of life. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about this idea of finding Ruth in the Pacific, where it is about the connection back to a diaconia of the sea. So we have this really beautiful images that are coming that that are there that need to be, I think, engaged with, and centered, and to be learned from. Um, I think, um, uh, I th and and I think again also of, um, for example, in the post uh, Bandung era in the 60s and the 70s, the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians 
who would uh, who were from uh, Asia, from Africa, um, from uh, First Nation communities, um, from Black communities in the US, who said, let's imagine a third something, a third other. So not the third world in a negative sense, as it is now, they've appropriate, they've taken that and turned into negative. But the initial idea was a radical idea of a third something that was different from the first and the second world. It was an idea or an, an a different idea um, imagined as a radical break. And the theologians um, the, of the Eat What, um, they, 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 they wanted this and they asked for a radical break. They wanted a, a theological epistemologies that were based on, for example, the broken body and on suffering. And somehow some of these things have got lost along the way, but I think they are coming back. I think that, I hope that my generation of theologians we're trying to argue that case again. Um, my worry is that sometimes um, we the academy is very good at sitting around and shouting at each other, but it doesn't get into the parishes. It doesn't go into the communities. And that's really where I think the importance of public pedagogy comes in. Um, the need to be like a little bit annoying. And what I do is walk behind my parish priest. I hope my Edmonton parish priest isn't on here because I used to just follow him around saying, Father, have you read this? Um, so <laughs> back to you, Randy. I'm sorry if I'm blubbering. It is quite late no, for me. No, no, no. <laughs> well, and, and, and that would be a great opportunity, Amara, and get to tell about both of you work in communities. Um, feel free to respond to anything that Anu said or, or anybody has said. Um, how do you try to bring it, bring, bring these kind of heady concepts into, you know, the parishes or the streets? You know, um, you know, where regular people are, the citizens of Toronto or wherever you live. Yeah, I, I agree completely with what Anu was just talking about. And <clears throat> when I think about, you know, something like prayer, for instance, uh, it's to me, it's not something that we say, it's something that we do. We live it out. You know, those concepts that have... Um, momentarily inspired people. I think of Jesus, Mohammed, and so many avatars that had come to and, and to have lived among our people and we're inspired for a little while and then we kind of come back uh, to the melodramas that, that sort of run our life. But but the reality, what what makes it different for me is I come from a culture that that is uh, verb based in the way that we think, in the way that we do. You know, um, you have to really live it out. The, the, the relationship is about how we live, is guided by our hearts, how we feel, how we live, uh, how we treat one another, how we treat the earth. They're all closely linked, you know, and so it becomes a, a kind of a mindset. If we don't, you know, in a way that Imara was saying, if we don't liberate um, these so-called realities around us, um, then we, we reduce the very prime motivation to something rhetoric, you know, and, and I completely agree with Anu, you know, we, it has to be, I think at this moment, it will be painful because we're not accustomed to thinking this way yeah. and living this way, you know, and it's gonna challenge the very foundations which need to be challenged. You know, this whole COVID experience was um, some, you know, time out enabled us to think about what's really important in society and, and each other and, and so forth. So what inspires me as, as uh, an indigenous theologian, if I can put it that way, you know, is how we live. And we practice this every day. Um, you know, treaties are, are really scary prospects to, uh, to most Canadians, and to most North American governments, but it's really the, the formality of our relationship here. No matter how we cut it, you know, as, as we were at land acknowledgement, we're on Indian country, you know, we're on Indian territories. And it's more than just territories, it's home life, it's home life, it's life that we share with other, the others around us who are not human. 
That's the kind of relationship that we all have to cultivate because that's where you find God. Mara? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I love and completely appreciate what everybody, what everybody's saying. I, you know, my work has been really focused either problematically so or rightfully so, I'm not sure yet, um, on transforming institutions. And that's a really difficult prospect considering that most institutions are profoundly colonial and profoundly committed to that project. But because they are what surround us now and what we have, a lot of my work has been around, whether it's been with the lab or with the city, is figuring out how these, the relationship between these institutions and you know, folks who are living in neighborhoods will be most affected, how that power dynamic can shift, how institutions can become followers of community and followers of people from the standpoint of strong accountability. And the reason why I think that's particularly important is because I think we both said it here, folks have been speaking about yearning for and needing decolonization forever. And when institutions enter into accountable relationships with people, they naturally get drawn into that and things have to fall away. The institutions have to radically change. People that were in power have to shift. Uh, and so for me, that, and I think when we talk about it from the spiritual paradigm, it's about acts of service and about how a shift in power ensures that institutions serve as they are supposed to. And in particular, from the standpoint of reparative justice and racial justice, be very intentional about how they serve from the standpoint of healing histories that brought us to this, to this place in the first place and how that healing process that is sort of created through new forms of accountability to the folks that we're talking about, to the neighborhoods that we're talking about, then create the foundation for a completely different world. Because I think what happens is, is that when institutions come into relationship with folks who have been agitating for, resisting, and acting to decolonize, they go haywire and panic because they start to lose their moral authority and they lose footing. But I think that's where we need to be. Some things need to be shaken up so much that they start to fall apart so we can rebuild them again. And we have to accept that because anything less is absolutely not sustainable. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of where I've been thinking about my work, but as you know, I think as we're all saying, it's a process. It's, it's not a mechanistic, this is what you do and this is how it works. It's a way, it's a journey, it's a relationship, it's an unfolding. Amara, are you willing to say a little bit more about what you mean when you say most institutions are profoundly colonial? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think um, most institutions operate on profoundly problematic hierarchies. You can see the racial hierarchies in our world reflected in institutions. Um, you can see the way institutions think about change or advancing their agendas um, as intensely mechanistic. Most institutions operate outside of a profound sense of accountability to the people around them, um, or at least feign accountability. Um, I think, and you can interpret institutions liberally based on what my background is. I won't speak directly to it, but you can, if you can get a sense. Um, I think most institutions are colonial because they do a very good job of protecting their power structures from being infiltrated by folks who weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is they end up glossing over that with conversations, yes, about equity, diversity, and inclusion, but in fact, they are institutions that are not ready and don't want to be changed. Um, and so I think you can tell an institution and its colonial underpinnings and its relationship with people in a particular 
indigenous, black and racialized folks, equity deserving folks, I think we can tell an institution um, is rooted in colonialism in terms of um, how it opens up its decision-making to folks and how it actually not opens up, how it releases its decision-making to community. Um, so those are, those are, those are some ways, but I don't, I don't know it all. So those are just, that's just like my sliver of experience. So I see that humbly, but that's my sliver of experience. Well, let's get some more slivers out there and get to Tanamuk and, <laughs> and you. What, what would you add about how institutions are profoundly colonial? Miss Randy, where do I start? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how long do we have? Um, I think I, I agree with everything that um, Imara has said. And I think, well, well, the other thing is this. I think that if we look at the idea of an institution in itself, that, that use of that word, shall we say, has <laughs> it conjures up for you a fortress. It is in itself meant to be exclusive. Um, and I think that's the first thing. So maybe we need to think also about our, our, our languages and how we're naming things, uh, how we understand things. Um, but if we look at an institution like the university or, or church, um, not all churches, but I'm a Roman Catholic. So um, if I look at my particular church and you know uh, the structures, not only the structures of hierarchy, but also even within a church that technically in its um, in, in its teaching um, says that there's no, just, no such thing as the right to private property is still wedded to ideas of growth, still wedded to ideas of the ownership of its land, still mm -hmm. wedded to a particular um, uh, sense of wealth and prosperity. I think that is how an institution is colonial. Um, if we look, um, I think, uh, uh, at the academy, even if we look at governments now, um, you know, one of the biggest, I don't know if you've been following politics in the United Kingdom, um, but the government that we have in place right now is talking about <laughs> um, creating growth. The idea of growth is based upon a colonial idea of continual expansion, exponential expansion, which can only happen through continuous extraction and exploitation, not only of um, labor, the labor of people, but it, it is also then the extraction and exploitation of land, of air, of water, of all of our natural resources. It is this idea that everything is, um, must be bent to the will of exponential progress. That is, essentially tied to what the European Imperial Project did in, in quite literally changing the geographies of the world. If you look at what the Dutch did to the Banda Islands in the pursuit of nutmeg, um, country I'm from, for example, where um, indigenous communities are still having, uh, because uh, crown, crown laws are still in place um, in Sri Lanka, uh, the uh, indigenous communities, the forest dwellers, are still having their land taken away from them, legally it's taken away from them, um, to um, plant um, for sugarcane production, you see. And there's no kind of legal standpoint in which they can um, argue, uh, argue back from it, but they are trying. Um, and then they have to find they have to find ways of entering into the system, becoming part of that system, taking on a colonized self in order to get their land back. You see, so these are the ways. So I think through the codification of law, um, through the through the continuation of certain systems, um, I often say to my students that if we really follow decolonization of the academy to its end point, it means the dissolution of the university as we know it, because the structures were set up for um, wealthy European men to study. It isn't set up for at all for someone like me, um, <laughs> you know. So these are these things that we need to, to consider to understand that the institutions themselves are set up for a particular ideal type of the human to flourish and for everything else to be in service to that. Um, that was a bit strong, sorry. <laughs> no, strong, strong is what we need. Right on. Yes. Strong is what we need, yep. 
I, I, I just wanted to uh, say in brief that um, it seems to me as, as I'm observing all the, and, and in my observation is it's like the institutional models kind of reflect where society is or mm. what society believes it needs uh, for protection maybe, you know, if some guarantee that we'll have a, a, a life that we can continue. Um, and it's like, there's no alternative. This is all they have. They don't, they're not able to think outside of the box of the containers that were, were created. Uh, and that the only possible future if we remain in the box is the end. You know, it's it's just a matter of time where, where people are not going to be able to even be, maybe it's not even how do we democratize the institution? I think that, I think what we have to do, I think in, in what Amara and Anur are saying that, you know, you have to take the walls down. If you have, and, and it would be a far better source of enlightenment if we take the walls down rather than let it fall down. Mm -hmm. If we're yeah. taking the walls down, then we have, a, uh, we have an understanding of the priorities. It's all about life, not just life among human beings, but life for everything. You take, you take humanity out of the creation paradigm and creation will continue. We're not, we're not necessarily, we're not ne a, necessary, a necessity you know, to creation. But we need creation in order for us to come. And, and as miraculous as it is to me, to my vision, creation is embracing humanity. You know, mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we are the children of creation, mm -hmm. you know? And the, the whole structure of creation is, is an intentional maintenance of life. We're, we seem to be the only species who are not thinking about the maintenance of life, we're thinking about the maintenance of power and of wealth, so-called wealth. You know, these are all these are all delusions that we create for ourselves. It has nothing to do with reality. So if we're talking about making an institution work, then it's got to be from ground level. That we put our minds together, we build together, uh, and, and that we have also that key element that the rest of creation needs the space that we're inhabiting as well to survive. So we have a, a responsibility to all life as well as to each other. I believe it can be done, but it's a scary picture for most people because they're living in the box, you know? And I guess maybe the message is it can be done. We don't need the box. We just need each other to feel and to love each other, period. Thank you all. Let's, um, let's get specific about decolonizing climate action. What does that look like? Or what, do, what, what, what should happen in practice there? How do we decolonize climate action? Uh, maybe we can start with Amar and then go to Anya and then get to Tenemuk. Uh, I can try. I'm, I'm sure uh, these to Tenemuk and, and, and Anu will have better <laughs> thoughts than me, but... Um, you know, I think I think in, in the climate action space, there is a lean towards and a reliance on technocratic responses to the climate crisis, particularly in my space, the climate resilience space. Um, there is, and you know, um, this isn't to deny that um, finding ways to retrofit buildings and um, ensuring greater flood protection are not important, particularly when we're living in urban spaces, but they're not the full answer. Um, and I think decolonization in climate action to me often brings us back to human connection, human relation, and the power dynamics that shape the way we conceptualize our future world. And so, you know, it changes the locus of the, or the, 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 the place of focus. So for instance, um, if I'm thinking about decolonizing climate action within the lens of climate resilience, I'm thinking equally about 
the accountability me mechanisms, the mutual decision-making me mechanisms that exists in our communities, between our communities and the spaces that make decisions, whether it be municipal government, provincial government, or federal government, whether it be institutions that are still colonial, but still have a role to play. Um, I think decolonizing climate change is about re-envisioning the place that countries like Canada that make such a massive contribution to the climate crisis play in the world. You know, um, I talked about um, Prime Minister Motley of Barbados. Many people across the Caribbean, many countries are having conversations about reparations and climate reparations in particular. And they're having calm conversations about climate reparations, not just, I think, because climate reparations creates an opportunity for a new fiscal arrangement and global comp compact that would allow countries like Barbados, like my own, to respond to the crises, but also because reparative justice transforms the collective consciousness of the globe in the same way that reconciliation transforms the consciousness of Canada and makes us better prepared to create something different together. And so I think uh, to me, decolonizing climate action is about shifting our focus away from a strict dependence on technocratic solutions. And it's opening us up to more difficult conversations around shifts in power and what it looks like to actually create that through accountability, through new institutional relationships or through institutions, as Andrew said, that dissolve into something different so that something new can be created. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, I'm sure folks will have a, we all have thoughts, so. Is it me next? Okay. Um, uh, uh, Imar, I'm glad you used um, the R word because not <laughs> everyone it's, it's always, you know, not everyone's happy when that's raised, um, but I think that's um, extremely important. There are so many things we need to do with decolonizing uh, uh, climate action, but I think the important thing is to be listening to those who are at the front lines of climate events who have been for, I mean, it's not just in the past 10 years. In 1988, the... Um, Filipino bishops wrote this tract called What Has Happened to Our Beautiful Land, where they talk about how the environment was being was already being degraded and they link it link it exactly to multinational corporations and what they were doing in the 80s. Even further back than that, um, um, Gregory of Nazanius in the fourth century, he sees climate um, weather events around him and he says, when, when, from whence comes this thunderstorm? And he says that it is because we have sowed where we should not be sowing. We have reaped where we should not reap. So that is that. It means that this consciousness of we have done something wrong has been, has has been in somewhere, and no one has listened to it. Um, right? Um, indigenous communities around the world have been screaming about this, but those voices haven't been centered. So the first thing we need to do in decolonizing climate action, you're absolutely right, Imara, everyone's now talking about green tech and electric cars and goodness knows what, absolute nonsense. They're not listening to those who are saying, this is what needs to happen. Um, I'm just gonna post in the chat, the 10 point plan from CARICOM, which I think is an ideal plan that we as faith communities should be looking at and saying, how can we respond to that? How can we take that on? Um, I think a lot of the reparatory, reparatory justice that the CARICOM 10 point plan talks about is, is embedded into how faith communities understand reconciliation and repentance um, and healing, right? This is about understanding essentially what are ecological sins. And I'm thinking of the ecology, not in terms of you know, just nature, but in the sense that the, the link between racial injustice colonial injustices and climate injustice, this is all part of one big ecological problem. So we have to say these are ecological sins, we must repent for what has happened, and we must work to reconcile them. So I think that's, that's one of the things that faith communities can do, find out who's, who has been talking about this and what they say needs to happen. That's really important. Um, my second point on that is that it's really key, and not all faith communities are are good at this. <laughs> some are, some aren't. 
we need to get better at being willing to build broad alliances what we can call rainbow alliances some of the most successful sort of movements that i have seen um uh, are where you can see communities of um, the indigenous communities, fishing communities, um, trade unions, um, feminist communities coming together to agitate on something together. So we need to be thinking of that kind of very purposive solidarity that's looking to um, address the intersection of injustice. Because when we're talking about taking those walls down, it is about saying, how do we not just survive together? How do we thrive together? How do we come to a fullness of life together, right? And these injustices are not separate. And we need to, as faith communities, thinking about that. The third thing, and this is a very particular thing I'm looking at is, um, you may have all heard of Extinction Rebellions, very, very big over here in the UK. Um, and one of the things that troubles me about Extinction Re Rebellion um, and even, um, Christians for Christians for Extinction Rebellion is that there's a lot of discourse in there that's apocalyptic oh, and it yes. and it talks about the fact that um, we have to address the climate crisis because we're going to face a problem of scarcity and then it talks about you know the fact that climate refugees will be coming into the UK and then we'll all be in this kind of you know race against each other that's a very race racial thing to say. It's pitting communities against each other and it's leaving the global south to fend for itself. It actually isn't built on solidarity. So I, I would I would say that the other thing we need to do for deconstant climate action is to look at our climate movements and say, what are we saying? Are we talking about, are we constantly pushing for technical solutions? Are we, are we creating these discourses about population and immigrants and so on that are actually antithetical to what this movement should be? Um, and so, and third, are we really trying to work towards reparatory justice? I think there's a, there's a need for some very serious conversations to happen within climate movements themselves, both secular and faith-based. So that's my sort of three little things there. Thank you. Wow. Very good. I, I, um, I think about um, kind of providing a, a critique where we are at the moment kind of thing. So there's, there's like several tiers happening at this, this point. The, our, thinking about what do we do immediately um, you know to to uh, lessen the, the catastrophic models that we're working with you know but the long the long range uh, is to dismantle the whole colonial structure altogether you know I'm I'm um, I'm taken back from the idea that you know we, we have uh, um, the reality that that Westerners tend to lessen the in intellectual cap capacity of people of color, you know, what, whatever whatever strata that we find ourselves in, even even the person on the street has such an intellectual capacity uh, that that we're all very deep thinkers. Um, I I find a lot of inspiration just coming and sitting with the earth, having ceremony, you know, in, in our, our little sphere of, of, of how we live, you know, it's a very practical uh, way of living, you know, we're talking about action, you know, it's, it's what direction do we choose to move in? And, and I think that, you know, my colleagues at, uh, for the love of creation, think about action, um, not so much related to how we live, but how we can influence our parliamentarians, you know, without thinking about that, that this whole system really needs to be democratized in the, in the sense that it's really the will of the people. You know, the will of the people seldom even 
is 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 even thought of, you know. Um, and, and I agree so much with with what my colleagues were saying here. You know, where are the politicians when when First Nations people are trying to defend their homelands? Those politicians who agree that we have to start to dismantle and become more transparent should be right there. You know, politicians should be there. Church leaders should be on the front line with us because it's not, it's not a us and them. It, it involves all of us. We got to really be thinking differently about, you know, First Nations have been talking, you know, to, to colonial mindsets from the, from, the, from the beginning of Columbus. This is not how you do things. You do things as, as, a, um, as a respect that the other next to me has the same needs as I do. And that those deer and those snakes and those fish have the same needs, you know. What are we doing thinking just about ourselves? You know, if we, if we try to form some kind of action, part of that action has to be to dismantle the very parameters that we find ourselves in, the boxes that we build, you know, the, the exclusions that we have when we, when we well, even the, the notion of human race, you know, and that this is racist and that is racist, you know, um, we're all in this together. And it's about time we start to dismantle those social boundaries, you know, we're all human beings, we all have the same needs as human beings. We take care of our collective needs, and then maybe there might be time for wants. But first, let's work on the needs, you know. Um, I was sharing my students, and I'll just wind up. I was sharing my students one time, I think this was 2013. At the time, uh, the US GMP was $24 trillion. And so I, I was surmising, well, we have a population of maybe 300 million. We can maybe round that off to a million households. If we gave a million dollars to a million households, that would equal $1 trillion, one twenty-fourth of the GMP of the United States in 2013. And what does that do? The well-being of people. One twenty-fourth of the trillion, you know, would have... I mean, we could eradicate, if it's our mindset, we could eradicate poverty in our midst. How can we have poverty and, and enormous wealth in the same space? You know, that means we have to be thinking differently about what is this we're doing? You know, why are we not doing? What are we undoing? You know, to be really, to be real about this. You know, and we have every, every source of infant uh, inspiration around us, we're just not paying attention. We're that oblivious, I think. Even when we're trying to do something, you know, it's more than just writing on a piece of papers, you know, about or, or getting on the phone and calling up our MPs and so forth. It's about how we live. And it's about how we begin to, to see ourselves in all peoples, in an all life. It's, it's meant to be clear. It's, it's meant to be clear. It's meant to be simple and not complicated. It just requires courage to think differently and then to reach out to each other and let's put our minds together. You know, um, I'll say this about the treaties. That was the whole idea about those initial treaties is how we're going to share the same space with two different uh, mindsets. The only way that we can come to that conclusion is we're all working at it together. Of course, I can spend a whole semester on this one topic. <laughs> you speak very eloquently. I could probably listen for a whole semester. Um, I want to go on to our third qu major question in a second, but I want to mention to the audience that after this round, um, we'll open up for questions and answers. So you can you know, put any questions that you want either in the chat or raise your hand and I'll try to call on you if I see it um, or Shannon can point it out to me. Um, and I wish everybody, I don't know what you're seeing on your screen. I'm seeing the four of us and the way it's structured is Anu is looking to her left, 
and Amara's looking to her right, <laughs> and it's like they're looking at each other. And and Gitsitana book is is above with me, and he's kind of looking downward at his computer as if he's looking at the two of them. And it's really, in my mind, a delightful image of the kind of conversation I think that we're having here tonight. So I'm absolutely delighted at that image. And and this is being recorded. So we will figure out what we're going to do with the recording, but I'm very happy that that's the way it looks to me because um, I'm very grateful for all that the three of you are saying. Um, so the last question that I, I had for us before we go into the question and answer is what would you like the people in this audience to do to help the processes of decolonization? So maybe it gets to Tanamook, you can go first, then Anu, and then Amara. What would you like the people in this audience to do? Excuse me. Well, that's the question, right? Indeed. <laughs> what do we do? Um, you know, I, I think about the, the, the work of reconciliation, and, and as Anu was saying about decolonization, you know, it has a, a, a grave danger of become a buzzword. You know, it's just something that we say. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's all about finding the courage to, uh, to do what maybe we're afraid of doing. You know, I think there's, there's kind of a, a, a deeply embedded fear of Indian country. You know, maybe, we're, maybe there's a fear that, that our anger is enough to inhibit people from reaching out. But, you know, um, in all my travels and all the people that, that, I, that I meet and that I will meet, no, <laughs> nobody in Indian country is talking about building the great ark and shipping everybody out. What we are talking about is how do we live here in peace, mm -hmm. in mutual respect a genuine experience of, of the kind of love that, that, that we hold for our children in our, in our communities, you know. Um, I, would, I think that our future, at least in this side of the world, if not globally, is based on indigenous lens about how we interrelate with each other, mm -hmm. uh, how we love our homelands to, to uh, the deepest, you know, root systems of our being, you know, uh, because most people don't know that, you know, and most people don't know about how it is to be on the earth, you know, and uh, the stratas that I work with is to encourage people to do exactly that, spend time with the land. You know, I, I use in my pronouns thing in it, you know, because a lot of my, most of my teachers are not human, you know, and I, there's great value in being with the earth and having ceremonies where, where we reach out to all the life around us because all that life contributes to the life of my family and me. Uh, we, when we identify ourselves, you know, our names, our clans, our nations, our confederacies, you know, these are these are human manifestations of our relationship to creation. It's not possible for us at any one time to live uh, without the presence of the sacred. We are embedded in the sacred, and we are all embraced by a, a divine love that that permeates everything around us. You know, I think that for the church. Uh, all the churches, I think at one time came from something like that, came from that kind of understanding. And we lose ourselves in this melodrama of power and, and, and global politics, you know. Um, I don't think that that was, that was the original idea, the original plan for humanity. You know, I think the original plan for humanity is taken right out of the book of creation about, about the life that flows in us as human beings is, you know, we're kind of like fractals of the universe, we're fractals of creation. You know, and I think that that's, 
That's the future. People who want to live here in Indian country, then you're going to need to embrace that, that kind of love and that kind of spirituality, you know, and, uh, and you're welcome. You're more than welcome to be here. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, I think I think what some, something important for those of us, particularly those of us who believe in the history of salvation, is to realize that creation is not separate from that history of salvation. Um, Christ is deeply incarnated into creation, into creation, a cosmological Christ, isn't it? And I think the, the sinful thing is done is to separate Christ from creation, incarnation from creation. And that's something that we can take on, I think, as Christian faith communities, is to be deeply reflective of that. Um, and, and, and we're not always good at doing that. But let us reflect upon, oh, thanks, Randy, um, from on, on the deep incarnation and uh, uh, and how it calls us to to, to radical love. Um, as uh, I guess Itan Jamuk just said, it, it's the call to radical love. And then radical love that pushes us into action. And action is different in, in different ways. Um, there are practical ways of course um i think uh, for example um if anyone on here is, is is a catholic person um i saw recently that the canadian bishops are um are working with the vatican to um on a statement that would reject the doctrine of discovery and i think if you are moved by radical love and towards justice you have a responsibility to keep the pressure on the um, canadian bishops to make sure that that does happen this is not going to happen without a movement of the people of God asking for justice. That has to happen. That responsibility has to be, I think, taken on. And it, it, it comes out of love. It comes out of the love that we have, that we have experienced in our relationship um, uh, uh, with Christ, or what we, we should be experiencing. Sometimes it's hard. Um, and I think the other thing is two other things very quickly is refusal what is it that we know that we or that we taught what moralities do we live within that we need to refuse because these moralities are unjust so this, this is this is a moment of reflection for us but also a moment of uncomfortable conversation be willing to have these uncomfortable conversations be willing to engage in the spaces where these conversations are happening where these refusals are happening. Um, and I, I encourage you all to read uh, Leanne Betasamasakis Simpson's work on refusal and also how, how to build um, radical community. I think that's a really important text for faith communities to be um, engaging with. And the third thing is be prophetic, be moved by righteous anger. There's nothing wrong with rage, I think. I think rage that is moved by love love for creation, love for one another. We shouldn't simply be, I think, um, you know, saying, okay, let's have, let's find these solutions or let's do this or let's do that. We need to be, we need to be angry at how slowly things are moving. We need to be angry. I mean, I'm personally, I was, I was livid um, uh, at the last COP when the paper on when when loss and damage was completely ignored, when faith communities and indigenous communities were physically shut out, and the language was um, sensitized to the point where it said nothing, and the conversation on reparations, exactly, Yusha, the conversation on reparations was effectively shut down. We as faith communities, because we understand the importance of repentance and reconciliation, from that point of reconciliation, should be saying the first point of call is reparations. It means land back. It means material reparation. And that needs to happen. And that needs to happen now. <laughs> There's no point in that. If you go to COP in Egypt, this is something that we need to be pushing for and placing 
that pressure on and that can come, I think, from building broad alliances and standing together and speaking from a position of love that leads us to this kind of righteous rage. Um, and I'm sorry for all the coffee I've drunk that makes me sound a bit preachy, but that, that is where, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, so what does this group do? I, what comes to me is um, the words of Bob Marley, um, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. The process of organization in self is such an important process, first and foremost. And I think we all need to be radically expanding our personal, spiritual, and psychological and emotional propensity for decolonization in order to enable us to be those radical actors that we must be in order to move this world forward in a very different place or to a different place. I think the other thing that I would say this group can do is that I think after and as a part of committing to that process. And I love what, what, what colleagues have said here, and friends have said here, is we are in a place where we have to embrace being profoundly radical. I grew up Anglican and was really transformed by James Cone's liberation theology. And I think being liberation oriented and profoundly liberation oriented being open to radical transformative change that calls us to be insurgent from the standpoint of love, but an openness to being angry and frustrated and pushing in really hard ways that we need to will become essential, but that's deeply connected to our carrying capacity for decolonization. Because it's so deep, even for me, someone who works on racial justice, my personal decolonization process is ongoing because that was the point. And I won't speak for too much longer, but I think the other thing is once we start with self and we do that, and we open ourselves to radically challenging and changing the spaces around us, what we can hope for and what we can bet on, and I believe this truly, is that on the other side of reparative justice, on the other side of reconciliation and land back, on the other side of all of the things that we have been fighting for and all the things that have been resisted by different powers that be, is the closest we can get to utopia. I truly believe it. And so when we think about the sort of nihilistic projections of the future, there is another story. There is a story that is utopian. There is a story about a world that is just. There's a story about a world that is healed. There's a story that has been remade anew and it won't fall again because the old orders have been completely deconstructed. And the values that we live upon are sound. That's possible. And we have to believe that. It's yes. awesome. Another world is possible. That's the message of the gospel. It's the message of hope. And thank you to all three of you for pointing that out and saying it so strongly and well. Um, audience, I want to turn it over to you right now. I'm going to put you on gallery, so hopefully I can see you if you raise a hand. Um, do you have any questions that you want to direct to any of the three speakers or to all of them? Um, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, if you're shy, you can put it in the chat and um, unmute yourself if you're okay with that. And and ask the questions. Are you absolutely overwhelmed or have they said everything that you wanted them to say? <laughs> or is it just really late at night? <laughs> So Randy, there is one in the chat. Okay. Kim asks, how do we decolonize climate action plans for institutions? Kim, do you want to say a little bit more about exactly what you mean by that? And then we'll turn it over to uh, the panelists.
I don't actually see Kim, so oh, there she is. Hi, um, our university is, I don't know if you can see me, yes, we can. Uh, is working on a climate action plan um, right now. And we're looking at climate action plans of other universities. Um, and one of the components is including an indigenous lens in this. And I, this is the reason that I'm attending this right now. Um, so I was just wondering if there are any things that we should consider um, that, that we haven't considered yet. So any of the three of you who has an idea, feel free to jump in. I'm uh, I'm willing to see <laughs> to see where that goes. If uh, uh, if there's always if if there's already uh, an invite uh, of indigenous voices in it, then you know let's see what happens from that. But that's really have to be our immediate future. That that people really need to be working with us on this. You know we've been and and you know I don't speak for Indian country, but um, no matter how strong the militarization of, of, of the development and, and exploitation goes on in our communities, um, we're going we're gonna to maintain our strength and resilience and, and resist it. Um, regardless of what the consequences are, that's, that's, that's about enacting that love we have for the land and, and for to life on that land as well as ourselves, you know. Uh, but I'm hoping that people have a, a, a much stronger capacity to see what's going on and to respond to that. You know, and as Imara said that, you know, it starts with our individual integrity. You know, uh, that's really, that's crucial. What we do with that from that time, well, you know, we, we have almost a whole encyclopedia of possibilities, what we do with that, that action, but it's important that we do something. Uh, and, you know, even if it is to, to write about it, to talk about it in editorials and so forth, but that's, that's just a step. I believe we have to live that way. So I'm really interested in seeing where, where this, uh, uh, this university is going to go with this and how Indigenous voices are going to, maybe it needs to be Indigenous led, put it that. And you and, and Amara, you both work in universities. And what kind of suggestions would you have, Amara? Oh, you're muted. Great. Sorry, folks. Sorry. Um, if it's okay, I could, I could just really speak from, so I, I, I work, my day life is working with the city um, and I spent the last few years working with the confronting anti-Black racism unit as a policymaker. And the lessons I've learned particularly to that question is that creating accountability structures um, that are tied to a particular plan are hugely impactful, particularly when they're public accountability structures that report out to the public. Most institutions like to hold to the moral authority. And so the way they hold to the moral authority is by keeping conversations indoors. But if you expose internal processes to the public and you create accountability mechanisms that have, um, for instance, in our case, for the anti-Black racism, you know, Black folks and accountability structures report to council publicly and it's in public document as to whether or not the progress of the plan is going well or not then that means that the institution, if it's historically colonial or inherently colonial, can't hold the process to itself, can't keep the process quiet, and can't control the narrative around whether or not the process is, is resonates with indigenous folks, black folks, what have you. Um, so my experience has been um, stripping the moral authority through public accountability, creating accountability mechanisms in which in policy it's very clear that the folks that are on this accountability mechanism are playing a leadership role in shaping the plan and making sure that they have the key points at which they can revise and or change the direction 
of the plan as a point of policy and agreement um, are some ways that that can happen. I'll stop there. I've already said too much, but that's that's one small step that I've seen that's worked. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't have a lot to add to what the previous uh, my, my previous two colleagues have said. Um, I absolutely agree, especially I think in Canada, it should be Indigenous led. Um, and I agree with you, Amara, that there must be accountability, transparency in these conversations. And a third thing to add here, um, one of the very, very um, difficult conversations that's happening um, especially in the Scottish universities at the moment, is that a lot of the, the, the bigger Scottish universities, the long-term ones that have been around for five, 600 years, Glasgow, Aberdeen, um, a lot of the university itself was built on, uh, on, on the profits of slavery, lots of the endowments, the chairs, um, and that was very much linked to a project that was extractive of land and labor. Um, and so one of the really uh, big questions has been, is our climate action plans at universities going to reckon with that? Um, as part of a bigger conversation that's happening in the United Kingdom right now with the national trusts and so on are having to, 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 to talk about these things. But it's a big, big question for, um, for universities. It's not only about divesting from fossil feels, but it's also about confronting the university's legacy and how the university has been complicit um, in, 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 in the crisis that, that, that is here now, um, in creating that, um, in that sense. So I think it's twofold. There's, there's very, universities are very good, I think, in rolling out technical things they're going to do, um, you know, oh, we're going to have reusable cups and we're going to divest from this and divest from that but it's also about having um it i think and it comes down to um thank you that's a great quote from mimi um it, it really really comes down to who's leading the process and i think um ensuring that the process is i think led um in a in in a plural kind of way that we're open about how that process is led and that we are inviting in to those conversations communities that are the most affected um i think is is really really key um uh so these are the i think things that are very key for universities uh, in terms of not only i think in climate action plans but also in addressing issues of um racism issues of diversity, um, universities are great at corporate diversity, but we, we know that representative politics um, continues to be something that does not create life, but actually represses life. So I think these are questions I would want to raise. I would look at the climate plans, climate action plans and say, is this just a technical response or is this a moral response? Is the, is the question I would probably, well, I have asked, which is probably why the rector doesn't respond to my emails anymore. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's a couple more questions in the chat and I'm gonna combine them together. Um, Jessica said that she's feeling very overwhelmed. I know a lot of people often say that sort of thing. So um, how do you find the balance? How do you not be drained by all of this? Um, and then somebody else had asked, what are some elements of spirituality that will sustain those who are courageously prophetic in the face of resistance? So I'll just open up to you. How do you keep going in the face of, you know, the swamp? Yeah. Well, um, Sometimes when I, uh, when I get a little in despair or a little confused, I go have a smoke, <laughs> go out into, uh, go sit on the land, have ceremony. You know, a, a simple thing like that, you know, breathing in the air, you know, it, it's more dynamic than we believe. You know, it, uh, it's not that the air is, you know, that there's nothing between us and the trees and all, it's actually full. When you think about, you know, water has memory, the land has memory, certainly. We're breathing in the air that our ancestors breathed. 
you know, when you breathe in and breathe out, you're, you're, you're also sharing your thoughts, sharing your dreams, sharing your confusion, you know, sharing your success. It's all out in the air. And then we're taking in the air from, from the trees and from the other life around us. You know, there's a unifying quality to all that, you know? And then uh, I think about um, a, a statement from Henry Thoreau once said that uh, each of us constitutes the majority of one. And when you, when you think about our relationship to creation, you know, there's, there's more life out there that is on the, on the higher con consciousness level. And when we strive to, um, to intentionally raise our conscious level, you know, then we're the majority. You know what I mean? Um, because the rest of creation is already at that level. You know, yeah. we we uh, we can um, we can go to great great lengths in our despair, but you know what? There's something miraculous if we stay with those feelings. Something wonderful happens. You know, when we analyze why are we feeling this way, what are what are the parameters around us that are making us feel this way, and when we stay with that, you know. Uh, it, it's like a message comes through with us. You know, we don't even have to know where it's coming from, but the fact that we're open, you know, you know, to 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 learning or to open to that kind of guidance, you know, it's wondrous. You know, I I like the idea that I'm a majority of one. You know, I'm in the majority. You know, because the rest of creation is there. It's easy to feel despair about this, but I'll tell you, um, that's where our power is, you know, and all we need to do is take that next step, breathe in deeply, breathe in the, the love in the dreams of our ancestors, it's still embedded in the air, you know. Um, there's so much about the power of the esoteric, what we don't see, and in, in what we don't see is what makes this life real. And I'll stop there. I can I can come in um, if that's if that's okay. Um, I think um, uh, I think that becoming the ability to feel have a moment of grief and to feel despair. I think. Is, is almost a privilege because there are so many who are drowning, um, look at the floods in Pakistan, um, baking, um, look at a lot, most of sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. So perhaps there isn't a moment to feel despair um, or grief or feel exhausted because it's a constant, it's part of the everyday reality. Um, and uh, Christina Sharp has this wonderful line um, uh, in, in her work where she says that for some people there has never been any other choice but to keep keep going at it, to keep fighting, to keep resisting. And I think every time I do feel or I have a moment to feel that, I think, no, what that's that's that is my privilege to feel exhausted. And then that pushes me to kind of push me out of my box. I'm not always very good at it, to be fair. Um, but I think that's something I try to to keep 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 in mind. And I think it's also about what creation teaches us. Um, one of the things I, I notice, you know, a lot. So I take, you know, I take public transport. I take the train a lot, and there's always plants growing big and thick and wild on railway tracks. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that's such a sign from the creator to say, "Look at this plant." Every day, trains go over it. High-speed trains. There's dirt. There's dust, and yet it thrives. It resists this terrible civilization that runs over it every day. And, and I think that is, that is literally the creator speaking um, to me, um, the, to us to say, this is what we have to do. Um, and I think that's really yes. important. Um, and the third thing is um, build community. If you build community and you're working within a movement, um, this is this is the support you get in order to um, to 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 
to to maybe when you feel tired, when it overwhelms you, community is really important. Building these alliances and and being within them, and and those communities also reve- are constantly revelatory, um, and 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 are important mm-hmm. for spirituality as well. So that's probably what I would say. Yeah, and I, I guess for me, it's um, you know, I'm I'm very Caribbean in the way that I that I hold uh, two um, faith systems almost, um, Brooklyn Anglican Church, but have always been very rooted in um, the relationship with my ancestors, and recognize yes. that in order for me to be here, my ancestors had to survive the passage the worst forms of violence you can possibly imagine. And that sometimes when we think about that, we think about that about that as people surviving intense pain, but that it required a massive amount of love to live your life through that. Yes. Love, love for self to survive all of that, which is what makes sometimes when we see what makes black folks so miraculous. And I think in many ways, knowing that I am the sum total of all my ancestors' love and efforts gives me the energy, but also knowing that I too will be an ancestor and will have to sort of think about what my contribution is to those that come after me gives me energy. Uh, because I was a recipient, I have to give. And then I guess the last thing is I have a big placard on my wall that says joy is an act of resistance. And I think for many of us, joy was not meant to be and not supposed to be. So prioritizing joy is a part of the movement in whatever way we can. Absolutely. Very much here for the Audre Lord reference there. Yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite lines from my, one of my favorite poems is, um, be joyful though you know the facts. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank everybody here for being part of this. I want to turn this over to Yuthra Safri, Chaffee um, to kind of wrap things up for us. Um, Yuthra is a uh, Brock University student and is one of the delegates to COP27 that will be sent in the delegation that Kairos and for the love of creation is organizing and she's one of the two youth delegates and she's here with us today. And what I had asked her to think about as she listened, so we're really putting her on the spot here, like talk extemporaneously um, from all this wisdom, all these thoughts, all these things that she's heard, what will she take with her as she heads off on the delegation to COP27, but also, and especially as she tries to communicate back to Canada and to Canadians, both during that time in November, but then, you know, afterwards as well. So uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, take it away. Hello. So first of all, I'd just like to thank the panelists so much for their time and their conversation. I wish I could touch upon and just talk about everything you all talked about today, but unfortunately, I don't have the time to do that. So for Anupama's sake, I'm going to run through this as fast as I can. Um, As an international student, I had relatively no knowledge of Canada's colonial history. What was worse that in my classes and courses, I was still not exposed to any of that information. Decolonization is something that is not a part of my syllabus and is often not brought up. One of our panelists said it best. Decolonization is not about engaging in a certain is, is about de- engaging in a certain level of discomfort and is not a buzzword. However, institutions and educational institutions specifically choose not to engage in that discomfort. The IPCC has also finally named colonialism as a driving force of the climate crisis. Yes, finally, it's about time. <laughs> that is a mold that I'm inspired to help break at COP27 and in my correspondence. I'm committed to using my own privilege to ensure that I am transparent about discomfort and uncomfortable topics, which includes topics of loss, damage, and reparations. Because as strange as it sounds, I think discomfort is part of what mutually respectful communication entails. One of our panelists brought up that a large part of colonization is engaging in deep discussions. 
that's exactly what I'm hoping to do as part of my correspondence. After all, all action starts with conversation, just like the ones we're having now. I think a big part of my COP27 communication approach is going to involve two-sided conversations. It is going to involve audiences, allow them to ask questions and give them a chance to provide their own answers and to respond. That's the best way to get more and more people involved and passionate. After all, as one of our panelists has said, <laughs> mindsets are as important to be decolonized as policies are. Another one of our panelists also briefly touched upon the concept of environmental racism. The idea of the global South being disproportionately affected by the activities of the global North. What I've noticed in my day-to-day -day life is that people know that this happens, but they are completely unaware of what and how much this actually entails. This brings up listening to those who are most affected by the climate crisis. For one of my classes, I was recently assigned an article about environmental racism. It was chock full of statistics and examples, but not a single quote, not a single interview. Safe to say I absolutely obliterated that article and the choice to include it in the syllabus in my reflection paper, emphasizing how important it is to include voices, to include the humanity. However, it is worth noting that this has to be done extremely carefully and respectfully. Our panelists talks about purposeful solidarity and how sub movements are harmful and all about pitting communities against one another partly what movements such as Extinction Rebellion do to an extent. It reminds me about how a lot of climate crisis discourse comes down to what about us? We're the ones who are suffering, which is a narrative that needs to be changed and flipped on its head. Equity is about making sure all voices are heard, not just the ones they want us to hear. This is something I hope to advocate for and engage with in all my COP27 communications. The topics of resilience were also brought up. I'm reminded of the quote, we should not call people resilient without calling out the systems that have forced them to be resilient. I'd like to tie this into the discussion of unsettling foundations, as one of our panelists very perfectly put it, which are achieved by both personal relational change as well as institutional change. Our panelists touch upon how scary it is, for lack of a better word, to change institutions because they are inherently colonialist. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it. That doesn't mean reparative justice is a discourse that should be ignored or stowed away, and that we shouldn't call out racist power structures and hierarchies. All of these contribute heavily to the climate crisis and something I, I aim to highlight in my communications. Furthermore, one of our panelists talked about growth and exponential growth and the idea of it being harmful. I'm reminded of a discussion I had with one of my professors. We discussed the use of GDP as a primary measure of this growth. But how does this one measure encompass all that matters to us? Spoiler alert, it doesn't. <laughs> we need to have newer, greener metrics, all of which have to involve this sort of institutional decolonization and breaking down of structures. Jacinda Ardern has famously said, New Zealand will no longer be a growth economy, further reinforcing the idea that a growing economy, but a suffering climate as if is a failure, not a success, as she refers to it. Our panelists also brought up the idea of power and how it's not just about redistributing power, but by changing systems and redefining power. I have to say this is a perspective that I will not only carry to COP27, but throughout my life. For some context, the COP27 agenda is arranged in a thematic format this year. Each day will be dedicated to addressing a different topic, and it is now more evident to me than ever that these themes themselves are dictated by power structures. This is why I love this. This is why I love doing the work I do. I learn a lot and have a lot to learn. I aim to immerse myself more in the literature surrounding power structures so that in attending COP27 and in my communications about COP27, I'm well aware of the uneven dynamics at play and how they should be redefined. Finally, I'd like to draw inspiration from the roots of one of our panelists because Mia Motley puts it best. Our world knows not what is gambling it with. And if we don't control this fire, it will burn us all down. So yes, to conclude, decolonizing climate action, it's definitely a good idea. Thank you, Yisra. I think that I hope you have it on gallery view so that you are seeing all the applause and the hearts around. Um, 
that was that was a really packed five minutes there or whatever it was and you touched on so many important points i'm very glad we have this recorded so that i can go back and listen to it um folks we are coming to a close here and so i want you to check out the chat and um particularly uh, roll back a, a little bit and look at the links that Randy had dropped in the chat for Kairos's advocacy on some federal bills to address environmental racism and improve Canadian corporate accountability. Follow that link and you will find the background that you uh, would need to understand Bill C-226, um, an act on environmental racism as it's shortcutted, um, as well as two corporate accountability bills, um, C-262 and 263. And there is a letter writing campaign in the works. Uh, so you have the option there from that link to just do a, a simple click and input your information. But you also have the opportunity and the encouragement to take the information and write your own letter to your MP or give them a call or try to set up a meeting so that um, you can add your voice to the growing voices that are demanding justice through our federal le legislation. And as I mentioned, the chat, um, a reminder that you are able to save the chat. You may want to do it. There was a lot of great information, some quotes, some links, some others that you might want to read. And we thank um, both part panelists and participants for all of that great information. As you continue um, to think about Climate action. I want to also put in a little plug for um, the For the Love of Creation uh, webinar series that will be in October. So, really starting just a week from today, um, a three week series uh, on the road to COP27. And so, you will, um, I trust that one of my colleagues will quickly find that link to drop in the chat as well and um, invite you to sign up for that as another option. Um, Kairos is a part of uh, this uh, climate justice initiative called For the Love of Creation, um, faith communities coming together to work for climate justice. And so hope that you can join us there as well. With that, one final thanks to our panelists, Gitsatanamuk, uh, Anu, Imara, Yusra. We thank you so much for your presence here today. Randy, for um, shaping the questions and offering the framework for this evening. I thank you as well. And thank you all for participating. Have a good evening. <laughs>